Hello everyone and welcome once again to Stitch Bliss Corner. Mary Rose here. <laughs> I'd just like to thank everyone for their response to my last video about Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth Woodville and Richard III. Now McKenna did ask some questions about the cards about how uh, Henry's wife Elizabeth of York was used as the template for playing cards and I do have a bit more to say about that but I think I'll leave it until my next video because I'm talking about something else today and I don't want the two to run in to each other not that they do but anyway <laughs> uh, now I have a Christmas stitch that I've started uh, it had to be pretty special to take the place of the scat for a few days <laughs> and it is I'll show it to you shortly um, and also I'm going to talk about art in so far as where stitching fits into it where I think it fits in it's a personal opinion of course only but that's what I do <laughs> anyway I'll just do the update on the scout first and then show you my Christmas stitching and then I'll get on with the other thing I want to talk about today. So there he is, the scout. And by the time he is finished, I will have done 140,883 stitches, approximately. So, I don't know, I think it's because I'm so useless at maths that I didn't sit and think to myself that each 10 square that I do is 100 stitches. <laughs> That's just mind-boggling to me, because it doesn't look like 100, but anyway. So, here we are. Now, when I left you last time, I was around here somewhere. So, I've gone right out on the side, and that's as far as he goes on this side here. And I'm leaving this little section here because that's going to be the signature and I want to leave that till last. So I now have to move across to this side, which I have, I've, I've started over there. And I have to go the equivalent out that side before I start moving up. So still quite a way to go on him. I'll just take him off this board and see if I can show you the full. So I can't see what I'm showing you. I'm just hoping that you see. Now I'm not concerned in the slightest about what the back looks like because I think and I don't think anyone should because when it comes to these works where you have so much confetti and everything, it is not possible, in my opinion, to have a really neat back. Um, I mean, in the days when people used to have lots of embroidery in their home and there was a bit of competition between people as to the neatness and everything, people just used to look at the back. Oh, you know, that looks great in the front, but I'll, you know, I wonder what the back's like. Uh, it was a, a matter of um, pride, I suppose. But when you're doing stitching like this, that you know is going to be in a frame, then why on earth would you concern yourself about what the back looks like anyway? I mean, that's really quite nonsensical as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't, it's just not logical. Anyway, so I shall put this fellow over here and introduce you to another... Well, I was going to say another fellow, but it's called a flower fairy. But I'm assuming you can have male and female fairies or else you wouldn't have any fairies, would you? So anyway, this is the one that I'm stitching. The holly fairy. And it looks to me, it says here, this is from... Oh 
month of December issues. Oh, Cross Stitcher, 2000, oh, probably 2004, because they're advertising the 2005 diary and stitching organiser. So, um, and there are some other ones there. Fabulous Flower Fairies collection. I'll just show you where I'm up to with this little fairy. I'm a great fan of little fairies that aren't grown up ones. Um, now this is on forget me not blue cotton even weave 28 count. And I'll just take that off now because it's rattling away. I thought I'd give you some technical details for a change because I don't really do many of those. So see it, how it's got little berries on the shoes and a little berry belt. <laughs> and uh, I've done the skin one over one, but the hair is going to be just two over two with the rest of it. But I think that's absolutely darling. And I tried to go commando. I, try, I tried not to use gridding, but I found it wasn't, I didn't like doing that. So I did some gridding after I'd started, sort of. And this kind of material is not very good for doing my kind of gridding that I usually do. So I just did like a, you know, a scaffolding over the top, which suited me. So that's the dear little holly fairy. And if that doesn't dance about on Christmas Day, I don't know what would. So, <laughs> that's, so that's my stitching. Now... I'm going to go on now to the topic of art in stitching and I did touch on this in my second video but I had a look at a few things, uh, a few photographs that are considered to be art and that started me off. <laughs> so I just thought that I would share with you some thoughts that I have. Uh, completely personal thoughts so you know um, but I don't see stitching as a hobby I think a hobby to me is something that you do to fill some empty hours you know just to if you're a little bit bored you turn around and do something but the stitches that stitches that I watch on floss tube so many of them say that they get stressed if they don't stitch uh, to me that's a passion. There's not something that you could take or leave. So I think it's in a different category to something that's a hobby. Um, you know, they say there's something missing in their lives if they, if they don't stitch. Things like that, you know. Now I've got some notes so I don't forget what I'm going to say to you. Um, now, art experts now call phot photography art. And to me, they can't have it both ways. If, if a photograph is art, then stitching is art by a country mile, as far as I'm concerned. Now, I've got a few notes here. Pause for a moment because I have to find them. Back again. <laughs> now then, are photographs art? At an early meeting of the Photographic Society in London established in 1853, members stated that photography was too literal to compete with the works of art because it was unable to elevate the imagination. This belief endured through the 1960s and 70s, but 
In the past 20 years, this belief has changed and photography is now considered to be art by art experts. Right, so. Because it includes photography, the modern meaning of art, this is me, seems to be that provided a creation evokes an emotion of some sort by the viewer, it is considered to be art. Now, there's a picture here. And this might be something of what they're on about. Now that picture is Edward Weston's Pepper, number 30. And of course, it is a capsicum. But it, it evokes something in you when you look at it. Okay. Now, it follows then that if you have stitched an image of an existing design, your work is art because the capsicum was ex existing in the first place. Because the specific uh, stitching work of art you have created evokes an emotional response in the viewer. So if art is art because the person who looks at it experience, experiences an emotion by looking at it, then stitching to me is one of the most evocative forms of, of creative pursuit that you can get. And I think it is the ultimate form of artistic expression then. Because from the minute you pick the fabric out and the threads and everything, now those threads, they run through your fingers you know, you, you lick the thread to go through the needle. The intimate contact with that work that you're making, it's, it's not only art, it's almost living and breathing art. You know, I mean, it's, anyway. <laughs> um, each stitch is unique and personally placed into position. Every 10 by 10 square on any stitching is a hundred stitches. Some painters at least seem to recognize that, the, you know, that this is something else that I was thinking. There are some painters that recognize the distance between what's in their head and what they put on the canvas or the paper to such an extent that they actually put their own bodily fluids into their uh, medium that they're painting with in order to feel as though there's something of themselves in their pictures, in their paintings. So they must recognise that wanting to essentially show yourself and represent yourself in a piece. Um, that's all I wrote there that bit anyway. So I'm going to now show you some photographs now this person here some of the people of my era would recognize this guy Andy Warhol and this guy brought about a new era of art it was called pop art and this is the kind of thing that he was showing now his ethos from what I can see of it is he said things like you know there's a picture of a whole lot of coke bottles and he said that uh, the richest person like the president could drink a bottle of coke and so could someone on the street with a, you know, a dollar in their pocket. The Coke was always the same quality, whether you were rich or poor. And this seemed to fascinate him. And I don't know if that extended to soup, but this seems to be 
one of his things, you know, the Andy Warhol soup cans. And this is another uh, one of his. And that girl there, she was a model in the 60s called Twiggy. And she was Twiggy because her limbs were so thin, they were like twigs. Um, and she became an icon. And this is where the 15 minutes of fame came from. So, now Andy Warhol, he had these studios where people used to screen, screen print a lot of his things and sign for him. In some cases, he didn't sign the work. And they were all considered to be works of art, even though he personally hadn't actually painted it personally that on that page that or that on that canvas they were basically mass produced but they were all considered to be works of art and then you have this very interesting piece of work here and this is by Lucio Fontana spatial concept waiting 1960 and it is you know canvas slash with razor blade is another term used for it. Um, now the original title is Concetto Spaziale Attesta. It's in the Tate Gallery in London and it blurred the distinction according to the art experts between two and three dimensionality. He did a group of slashed canvases called tagli or cuts. Each cut was made with a single gesture using a sharp blade. The canvases were then backed with strong black gauze, giving the appearance of a void behind. In an interview, Fontana said, my discovery was the whole, and that's it. I'm happy to go to my grave after such a discovery. Now, brings me to this next couple. This is Christo and his wife. Oh. There we go, my usual. <laughs> Do you know, I shouldn't really use this iPad, should I? <laughs> anyway, that's Christo and his wife. She looks like a gregarious character, doesn't she? Okay, so they're considered as artists. And this is the reason. John, a Christo and Jean Claude, or Jean Claude, wrapped Reichstag, Berlin, 1971 to 95. Um, hmm. So that's that one. Then he decided, well, they decided to go down to Australia and wrap up the Opera House. That was in 1969. quite sure where that is. I haven't got that written. But you get the idea. That looks like fabric to me. <laughs> and it looks, he's considered to be an artist, he and his wife. Now these guys, Gilbert and George, they're also artists. And there's a famous artwork by them. Um, how can I put this delicately? Well, it's matter from their bodies that they've taken sort of prints of and put it up. You, you can see it if ever you have a look on the internet. Here they are again. And now we come to the art of photography. And this is called Untitled, um, hashtag 96 in 1981, Cindy Sherman. Now, this sold in May at an auction in 2011. And I'll give you three minutes, oh, well, not three minutes, count to three, 
and you try and think of how much this sold for. Thirty thousand, hundred thousand, not even close. Three point nine eight million dollars. Now this one, Rhine two, this was in nineteen ninety nine, Andreas Gursky, sold for $4.3 million in November 2011. The photo, which was produced as the second and largest of a set of six depicting the Rhine River, was sold to an anonymous buyer. This is another one of Andreas's, the supermarket, by the looks of it. 99% to Dipticon, 2001. Measures almost 7 by 11 feet. Sold for 3.3 million in February 2007 and it's called Inside a Supermarket. I wonder if they'll do a heaven and earth design of that one. Hot red chilli pepper cut with razor blade Photo canvas print. And I don't know if that's gone up for auction. And I don't even know who's actually done that. But I think you get the idea. Now, here's a few pictures by contrast of some stitching. Now, they say they're throughout history there haven't been many female artists you know comparatively speaking but there have been plenty of them it's just they used a needle and thread because those were the materials they had you know I mean there are celebrated uh, portraits done by you know male painters and everything well a lot of them had money or were uh, had backing, you know, by someone to paint things and they sat in their studio all day and that's what they did and that's great. But the women didn't have access to a lot of those things. I mean, of course, Victorian women, if they were, you know, of uh, means, they could do watercolours like Beatrix Potter did and all that sort of thing. But generally speaking, the average woman, if she wanted to express herself artistically, she sewed. And she did embroidery and she did whatever things for the home, crocheting, knitting. That was her artistic release and that was her art. So here's an example here. Patchwork quilt cover made for a holiday cabin by Isabel Bellingham, 1943 Sydney, 200 by 120 centimetres. It is made from scraps of old material, including silks, cottons, dress lengths, tea towels and curtains. How many million do you think that should bring at an auction? All the soul in that comes out at you. All the clothes that were worn, worn until they were nearly worn out. Bits cut off people's clothes that they wore. We're on, well, we're on the topic here. There's another one here. Mrs. Gertrude Pepperell of Glen Iris, Victoria, knitted squares from odd balls of wool and sewed them into blankets for each of her children and grandchildren. She was then in her 80s and almost blind, but kept up the tradition of never being idle.
ditto to the last piece of work that I showed you. These are all beautiful artworks by women. And why there's any kind of conjecture about whether it's art or not in the art world is quite beyond me. <laughs> it baffles me, truly baffles me. Then we've got here, Fishing Lady Chimney Piece, a needlework picture embroidered by the wife of Colonel Sylvanus Bourne in New England, 1740 to 1770. Wool silk and metallic yarns and spangles embroidered on linen canvas. Now, all of that has run through her fingers. She sat there and stitched when she had some time. She's got all other things to do, busy days. She's not somebody that, oh yes, you know, I've got some sponsor that's paying for me to sit in this studio and stitch all day. She had to fit it all in with a busy life. That speaks volumes. Cindy, she sent this to me. Doesn't that mean more than a picture or... Even, even when you paint something, there's still a brush between you and the paper or the canvas. There's still a brush between you. That's not, doesn't happen with stitching. It's directly on there. And uh, this few last bits and pieces here. Yes, I'm about to finish here. I'm just going to say, in the end, I guess it's to thine own self be true. Um, if you see what you do as a hobby and a project or whatever it is that you're stitching on, and I'm including here, if you get a design and you stitch that design that was created by someone, it's still your artwork because when someone goes out and, and takes a photograph of a sunset, if he can do that or she and send it off to some auction house somewhere and get so many million dollars for, paint, for taking a picture of something that is already there, then your artwork of t copying a chart is just as much artwork because your stitches are unique and the emotion that someone has when they look at your work is all part of the whole design. The design on its own, yes it's beautiful, whatever you pick or it might not be beautiful, it might be something that is a bit hideous but you want to sew it, you want to stitch it, you want people to have that feeling when they look of it, look at it of feeling horrified or whatever you want. But your work in there is integral to the whole piece. That's the point. So that that's art. Oh, anyway, I'm, here I am telling you this is up to you, <laughs> up to you what you think. But I, my own opinion keeps butting in. I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah. Now this guy here. This is a very good definition that I thought I would finish up with. And it's the definition of art by Federico Fellini, Italian film director. And he said, he said, all art is biographical. The pearl is the oyster's autobiography. And that's food for stitchy thought, isn't it? So I guess what I'm getting at is that whatever you stitch, whether you sat down and drafted it out and put it on a grid and stitched it, or whether you bought it and got all the threads and stitched it as the design 
demands. It is your work of art. And something to be proud of. And something that to me is more than something that is painted. And this is coming from someone who does paint. I paint pictures. But my stitching to me speaks more than my painting does. Even if I'm, paint, even if I'm stitching something that has been created by someone else originally. And, and that's the point. I don't think that the art world or the experts, whatever they call themselves, can have it both ways. Either a photograph is not art or it is art. And if a photograph is art, then stitching without question is art. Okay, <laughs> very good. <laughs> All right, well, if you've lasted this long through this little homily delivered from Stitch Bliss Corner. Thank you very much for your company. Um, I will be coming back uh, with the Eleanor of Aquitaine piece that I promised and also a few other bits and bobs. So you never know what's coming. Uh, I don't ever know what's coming. And I shall catch you later and all the best to you from Stitch Bliss Corner. Bye for now. <laughs>